Welcome everyone who's joined here today. I'm Zlatanel and I'll be chairing this event today. So I would like to thank everyone who came here on behalf of the organizing team. This event, Physics Meets Biology, is organized by IAPS and IUPAV, International Association of Physics Students and International Union for Pure and Applied Biophysics. It aims to show connections between two fundamental sciences, biology and physics, and to present the field that connects them, physics, uh, sorry, the field that connects them, biophysics. The concept of this event includes three talks each day. The first talk will be by a senior lecturer, and then two talks after will be by young researchers. You can see the full schedule in this video's description right under. So the first talk for today is What is Biophysics by Anthony Watts. Before the talk begins, I would like to invite Ruhi Chitra, the president of IAPS, to briefly explain what IAPS is and what its, its activities are. Hello everyone, welcome. Great to have so many of you joining us today. So yes, um, I'm speaking on behalf of IAPS, the International Association of Physics Students, and I'll give you a very brief introduction to what we are. So, um, waiting for the next slide. Yes, there we go. So we've been going for more than 30 years. Um, we're founded in Hungary, but our headquarters are now in France. And um, we are run by physics students, for physics students. And um, and as you can see, we're, um, we're not here for money or anything like that. We're here because we love it and um, we want to be as supportive and inclusive, inclusive as possible. So the way we're structured is we have national and local committees around the world and um, about 65,000 members in over 70 countries. Our main decisions are made by our general meetings. So this is comprised of delegates from our national local committees and individual members. And our day-to-day -day decisions are made by our executive committee. So here is roughly the spread of members that we have. Um, and yes, as you can see in countries where we don't have a national or local committee, you're welcome to join as an individual member. And you can see our website, iapps.info for more information about membership and things like that. So here is uh, here are just some of our members to give you an idea. And um, you're, anyone is eligible to be a member of IAPS as long as you are um, studying physics or a related subject at university level or have recently graduated within the last year. So it'll be great to have you join us if you haven't already. Um, here are some of our activities. We have uh, the International Conference for Physics Students, which is held every year in different countries. And it was held last year online in Denmark, um, this year in online from Mexico, and then next year in person um, in the Philippines. So lots of different countries. Uh, we also have the Physics League across numerous countries for kick-ass students, which is our main competition. This is, um, yeah, held in different countries every year as well. So the winners of the national preliminary competitions in each country go on to the international finals, which will be happening in Munich next week. So that's really exciting. And we have a journal of, um, of IAPS, which uh, is called JIAPS, and Zlatan, who is our chair today, is actually the editor-in-chief of that journal. So yeah, plenty of things going on. You can see a few other things here, and we have many other events happening each different year as well. And you can see our social media for more information on that. We have we provide grants. Uh, here are some of our partners. Um, all of this is on our website, so just um, have a look at that later. Um, okay, so how you can get involved. There are so many ways. We have plenty of really active working groups all on our website as well. And these are just really um, low commitment ways of trying out IAPS and getting a feel for our community. We have loads of events and here is our social media and different ways to find out more. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. I'll pass over to IUPUB as well. And yeah, enjoy the event. Thanks Ruki for such a great presentation of what IAPS is. Um, the next speaking will be Anthony Watts, the president elect of IUPUB and also first lecture for today. Um, he'll try to answer the key question, what is biophysics? And before that, he'll also briefly explain what IUPAB is. In case you have any questions, uh, you can post them in chat also about IAPS and IUPAB, but there are also website links in this uh, video's description for both associations. 
So thank you very much, Zatan, and also Rui for that uh, description of IAPS. And we are delighted at IUPAB to take part in this capacity building exercise. Essentially, we'd like to let people know what biophysics is. Biophysics and biological physics is a, a major activity, but often people are not quite clear what biophysics is. So we're trying within IUPAB uh, educational events to uh, broadcast our, our activities and what we do. So IUPAB, as Svatan said, is the International Union for Pure and Applied Biophysics. We have an executive committee, the president, president-elect is me, the treasurer, uh, Christina Sison from Paris, um, and Ron Clark from Australia uh, is the secretary general, and Manuel Prieto in Portugal is our current president. Um, <clears throat> IUPAB is the World Federation of Organizations in Biophysics. We have our website, you can check that out there. Um, we have adhering bodies of around 61 countries all around the world with around 12,000 formal members. Uh, that in also includes national biophysical societies, national research councils, and also academies of science. And then there are three major regional organizations of biophysics. One is the Asian Biophysical Association, the European Biophysics Societies Association, EPSA, and then the Latin American Federation. And they are all uh, affiliated through uh, IUPAB as adhering bodies. <clears throat> IUPAB has been a member of formerly ICSU, but now the International Science Council um, since 1966. And that is a non-governmental organization of 40 international scientific unions and associations. And it has over 140 national and regional scientific organizations. It advises science policy worldwide, including to the United Nations. So it has a very pivotal role in science worldwide. There are sister organizations of IUPAB. There are many unions, but in particular, the chemistry, physics, mathematics, biological sciences, and then biochemistry and molecular biology. We are relatively small compared to some of the large ones like chemistry and physics, but comparable with the others. <clears throat> so our mission statement is to coordinate and support research and teaching in biophysics. We organize biophysical congresses. We have a triennial congress. We support conferences, workshops, schools, and exchange visits between laboratories. We have three main task forces historically. As part of this uh, event today, education and capacity building, we're working with student organizations, in particular IAPS, you just heard that, but also we know that people from chemistry and biochemistry and molecular biology are also uh, online today and welcome to you all. We also have a structural biology uh, task force and a big data in biophysics uh, task force, all organizing their own events supported by uh, IUPAP. <clears throat> just one or two of the events taking place uh, this year, uh, some focus meetings, in particular this one in Canada, neurotransmitter uh, um, gated ion channels, for example. The British Biophysical Society is a joint event with IRE. Now, Ireland doesn't have a biophysical society, but this is an, an event to try and stimulate more interest there. And that's in Galway. And then also in South, South America, in Brazil, in fact, we have a course and a biophysics congress, which is we're supporting at the beginning of uh, September. And there are travel bursaries available for all of these, supported by IUPAB. And then our main triennial congress I, I, I mentioned to you, a delayed from 2023, but it's now 2024 in Kyoto for the second time. It was there in the late 1970s before. So bursaries, in particular for those going on FEBS and EMBO courses just recently, uh, from countries that are excluded for support by FEBS and EMBO, uh, we are willing to look at those applications. So we look forward to meet, seeing you at meetings and hearing from you. So what, what is biophysics? Well, biophysics is a so-called bridging science. And Ed Eggelman, uh, the president of Biophysical Society, said biophysics is just what biophysicists do. Uh, which isn't very helpful, but it is difficult to define sometimes. And there is something of an identity crisis within the biophysics community, trying to define our own activities and what we do. But what we tend to, to try and do is, is link physics, as, uh, as Natan said, 
and other sciences, and I'll talk about some of those as well, to understand how biological systems work. Now, um, in about 1960, a group of scientists in the UK uh, got themselves together, included uh, Tony North, one of the founder members who, who's still in Leeds, and put together a little booklet on why biophysics. And they said that biophysics is a young, exciting, and interdisciplinary science it attempts to find order in the apparent chaos exhibited by living systems. So that was a view that it was expressed at that time. They addressed the biophysicist in a hospital, and many of you who have been into a hospital environment may well have seen lots of instrumentation and equipment, and that requires a physics approach to biology and to living systems. But they also pointed out that anybody in that kind of environment also should have a good knowledge of biology. So this is spanning from physics to biology. They also pointed out that if you're planning a career in research, Biophysics is one of the most exciting of all possible scientific areas. And they also pointed out there were just seven universities at that time that they knew of in the world that ran biophysics courses. And one of them was Leeds, where I went to as an undergraduate in the 1960s. <clears throat> so the Biophysical uh, 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 International Union of Pure and Applied Biophysics was set up in 1961. And just before that, in 1957, there was the first biophysics meeting in the United States. And there, the idea was to, an interesting note, uh, sorry, to organize a biophysics meeting with the ulterior motive of finding out if there was such a thing as biophysics, and if so, what sort of thing this biophysics might be. And interestingly, one of the founders, one of the members of that group was originally trained as an astronomer, but later became interested in viruses. So it's interesting that physics were, physicists were moving over to the biological problems. And now, of course, we have annual meetings worldwide. EBSA typically brings in a thousand people or just over, and then the Asian meeting as well. So biophysics is a fairly large uh, activity. The Biophysical Society has also put together a list of Nobel Prize winners who would associate themselves with biophysics as a field of study in which they were involved. We have uh, Perutz and Kendrew, for example, early protein crystallographers. We have even uh, more recently in, in the last couple of years, Nobel Prize winners that's 2021, um, who have been working on channels. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, in a moment. And many num names here are of people who recognize biophysics as part of their um, research activity. And really thinking about biophysics as a, a research area, what we tend to do is exploit the electromagnetic spectrum to study biology in its different forms. So uh, we can use x rays, we can use microwaves, radio waves, and we often use the interaction of radiation together with living systems and molecules to try and uh, obtain detailed information about how biology works. Now, structural biology typically is looking using x-rays and x-rays uh, often they really need single crystals. Uh, in the early days, zinc sulfide was used to prove in fact that X-rays were waves rather than um, uh, 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 resolve a long-standing controversy about X-rays were waves or not. And as a result of that, diffraction patterns are formed from single crystals of often now biomolecules. That produces an electron density map. And that map in the early days was actually put together on glass plates. I remember doing that as an undergraduate. And from that, we produce a structural model. And the reason why this works from the physics point of view is that the atoms within the crystal typically have a distance between them, which is in the uh, angstrom range, and the x-rays have a wavelength, which is again in the angstrom range, thereby resulting in a diffracted beam. And that is a requirement for diffraction, of course, and you can do that with light, as you know. So from this electron density map, we need to fit the atoms from our molecule, which we know from chemistry, into some structure. 
And that's exactly how X-ray crystallography works from the physics of diffraction through to the model building that we produce. And Dorothy Hodgkin was one of the early people to be recognized for some work on biomolecules, in particular uh, uh, vitamin B12. Uh, and she was recognized for that kind of work uh, from here in Oxford, in fact. And then many of you will know about diffraction of X-rays by DNA. <clears throat> and here, an oriented DNA fiber containing uh, the nucleotides, and there are four nucleotides, and of course at the time it wasn't clear how those four nucleotides assembled within a DNA fiber and how the information uh, was replicated uh, within a living cell. And so four simple molecules, how do they uh, replicate and how do they align? Well now of course we, we know that the diffraction pattern from this uh, fiber diffraction here produced these Bessel functions essentially in a cross shape, and that is typical for a helical pattern in your diffracting molecule, in this case, uh, DNA. And it was Rosalind Franklin to, together with, uh, of course, uh, Jim Watson and Francis Crick, who resolved the uh, double helix of DNA. So the kind of outcomes from this very early research in the early 1950s, and it's important to, to, to realize the timescale of, of the applicability of such research, not only has been uh, uh, vital for understanding, uh, characterizing hereditary diseases, gene editing, very new technology, but also many other aspects, for example, DNA fingerprinting uh, um, and characterizing pathogens, and even PCR tests rely on this kind of information. So we shouldn't discount any basic science within this area. I don't think anybody perceived of such applications when they started this work. Uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. <clears throat> so moving from nucleic acids to proteins, um, there are about 200 million node proteins. And about 20,000 of them are in the human body from open reading frames, many modified subsequently, of course. But the structures are only known of about 17%. So this is a huge activity within biophysics, is resolving protein structures. Now, we know that there are about 20 amino acids in a single screen, string, and what we need to know is how they fold up. We can classify the amino acids in different ways and how they string along together and are, are as a, a polymer and then fold up into a secondary structure. Then those that folded structure in tertiary and then quaternary, where many units come together, is really one of the major challenges in structural biology. And biophysics is the area uh, that, that addresses that problem. Again, we have a protein crystal. This can often be the toughest part of the challenge, getting a protein crystal. It's much easier these days. There are many uh, good techniques that have resolved over the years and the decades to do that, but still it's not trivial. And often the quality of the crystal um, is the determining factor in the quality of the outcome of the structure. Again, we go through diffraction, we go through electron density map, and then we produce a model, and then a final model structure, often with multiple units of the protein um, together in a quaternary structure. So the first protein structure, in fact, was myoglobin, 17 kilodaltons from Kendrew and Perutz way back in 1957. And what we have learned over the years is there are actually a limited number of structure elements, helices, sheets, many types of helices and sheets, but how they fold together. The loops, because they are disordered, and to get diffraction, you need molecular order. If you don't have molecular order, then you won't have macromolecular order to form a crystal. The loops between these can be very difficult to visualize, and you may need other methodologies. I'll mention one or two in a moment. But something that has come to the forefront is that disordered proteins are actually quite important. Disordered proteins often have uh, very uh, important functional consequences. And how those disordered proteins are then maybe ordered in a functional state is a very active area of, of biophysics and research. Now, there is something of a limit for crystallography uh, for single proteins. Um, typically up to 200 kilodaltons, typically up to this kind of size, two to 100 nanometers. But then we often have to put together individual units to make up 
multi subunit complexes of various types. Uh, and that is again a computational challenge uh, that we have to take on board and other methods. And I'll mention those in a moment. Now we need somewhere to put all this data, it's huge amounts of data, and we need to know what to do with it. Well, there's something that was set up called the protein database. And this protein database has uh, is a repository for all of these uh, structures, and they have to be validated before they can be published. And typically around 14 to 15,000 structures per year are produced. We now have about 188,000 of those in the protein database uh, from um, crystallography and from NMR, in fact, I'll mention that in a moment. And the first virus structure, since it's topical, came out in about 1978. And again, Dorothy Hodgkin was involved with that. If you look at the protein database um, file uh, today, you will see that there is a new page, COVID-19 coronavirus resources, because of its importance. <clears throat> if you click on there, you can now see PDP structures, and this is as it stands of last month, March the 16th, of all the SARS-CoV-2 PDP structures in, in, in the uh, database. This, of course, is the famous spike S protein, which is the one to which antibodies are um, designed to go into vaccines that we all, of course, now uh, know uh, so much about. <clears throat> So what about large structures? Some of these proteins are much larger than this molecular weight cutoff of around 100 kilodaltons. Well, a new method, methodology has, uh, has developed over the last decade or so called cryo-electron microscopy. In this case, the protein does not have to be in a crystal, but has to be in, it is in a solution, so it's closer somewhat to a cellular environment. Using electron microscopy to magnify images, we can produce uh, initial models for the shape of that protein, especially if it's a large one. And here you can see there's lots of units of this protein. And then when we've resolved some initial uh, model, we can then use cryo-electron microscopy. So here we're freezing the sample down so that thermal vibrations of the molecules don't distort the image and better images, we're going to hear more about this from beyond in a few minutes, then you can build up final structures um, of, of your protein. And here I've got just two recent examples. This one is of a SARS-CoV-2 Omicron spike. And there's an explanation why uh, some antibody resistance has been found in the Omicron, and that is the position of part of the spike protein is occluding or preventing binding of the antibody. And that's the explanation here. That just comes from last month in cell reports. And here I showed you a double helix before from the oriented fiber work. Here is now an extremely high resolution uh, structure of DNA, not only the DNA itself, but also with the uh, protein associated with chromatin here, can, which contains, of course, the, the, the genetic information. And you can see how things have improved using these cryo-electron microscopy uh, methodologies. And it was Richard Henderson here who got the uh, award and Nobel laureate, Nobel Prize for that uh, development. So molecules are fixed in crystals. So how can motion be captured? Well, we need to look at non-crystallized environments. And one way of doing that here is a protein walking along um, a, a scaffold protein holding a cell together. I think this might be kinesin. So the individual structures of these individual protein units can be put together and then using computational and modeling methods uh, to try and understand how that protein um, uh, functions within the cell. Another way is to use free electron lasers firing at crystals. Here, the physics of this development um, have been, of course, fundamental to this. Here's one of my students. And here we are firing a free electron laser at some crystals that are coming through the beam. And these are crystals of a protein which is responsive to light. It's a photoreceptor protein. And by doing this, we can see uh, motions within this protein in this kind of picosecond time scale. Here, as light hits the retina within the protein, 
we can see initial movements within a protein on an extremely fast time scale as a photon of light is absorbed, in this case, by retinal sitting in it, it, its binding site. So we can start to look at dynamics using these structural biology techniques of a wide range of time scales. <clears throat> now, you will hear on Thursday from uh, Helmut Grubmuller, <clears throat> theory and modeling computational methods, just as a summary here of some um, interesting observations that have come from the physics and spectroscopy. In this case of a biological membrane around a cell, these lipids are exchanging places with their neighbors a million times a second, for example. They're rotating around their long axis in nanoseconds, 10 to nine times per second. And this all forms a um, structural uh, uh, complex, which holds our cells together and it has a thickness of around four nanometers. So th th this has fascinated me for my whole research career, um, how these uh, membranes uh, associate with proteins and how they function uh, in a living cell. <clears throat> so this kind of, this is a model membrane of just the lipids here, but a more complex membrane here of a cell is shown interacting in this case with a virion. And this is a, uh, molecular dynamics calculations set up. And you can see here the spike proteins, how there's an indentation here, and how this is going to fuse with the cell to then release its contents of clearly into the living cell. And here are the spike proteins moving around, dancing around in a membrane uh, from, again, a simulation. And even this kind of detail, water molecules uh, of a membrane protein sitting with them in a membrane here, and how the, the protein has motion there and how molecules can get across here and even down to watching sodium ions traveling across a sodium channel here. I'm sure we hear more about that, more about those kind of uh, uh, mechanisms from Helmut on Thursday. So what about artificial intelligence? You may well have heard of AlphaFold. What does it do? What does it mean? Well, here, um, an AI algorithm has been used to identify parts of a larger problem. What it does is to train the deep mind, train the program over 170,000 proteins from the protein database that I showed you earlier to try and converge on the structure. So that really means taking the linear amino acid chain and folding it up to this using an AI approaches. And that has now been done for uh, a number of uh, systems and um sorry and now it's possible to uh, predict secondary structures in this way and in fact uh, even up to 2700 residues were used in this so the outcomes from these kind of structural biology approaches proteins clearly are important for drug targets for protein drug interactions and uh, cellular control biotechnology food science and architecture of pathogens so the outcomes of this long line of uh, structural biology again from the 1950s and before has had uh, far reaching implications we're going to hear next from Sai about nuclear magnetic resonance. This is looking at the interaction of radio waves, longer uh, wavelength radiation uh, with biomolecules. Just to give you a couple of examples, ligands, which bind to proteins, this could be a drug. We need to know which parts of the protein are important for binding when we're designing new drugs and the kinetics of the way in which these um, ligands bind is also important. And that can come out from um, nuclear magnetic resonance studies where we can observe the small molecules themselves binding to a large protein. And uh, this is a large area of, of, of research in itself. The important thing here is that this method is non-destructive. We don't need crystals. We have a cellular aqueous environment and the molecular motion and dynamics is on the kind of millisecond to nanosecond time scale. And a lot of biology happens in this kind of time scale. <clears throat> We're looking at visible isotopes in biology. These are stable ones, typically protons, 1H, deuterium, should be 2H, sorry, 13C, nitrogen, and phosphorus. This is an interesting uh, example that's come from the Drug uh, Administration, uh, FDA in, in, in America, where they resolved a dependence on the purity of drugs. So that's going from less pure to pure here, and these are recreational drugs on the chance of death. The more pure a drug is, 
the less chance people are dying of overdosing, which is quite an interesting observation that, that, that has been used to try and modulate and, 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 and understand the purity of the, these drugs that are imported. So that's why there's a lot of control on drug purity that is, is used in the recreational area. Molecular structure, of course, comes out of magnetic resonance. In particular, um, this is a heme group. So this molecule, cytochrome C, transports electrons between bigger proteins. This has been widely studied by nuclear magnetic resonance um, because of its uh, special properties. And then just one last method. This is a large superconducting magnet into which a patient is being uh, immersed for magnetic resonance imaging. And that comes in particular from the work of Peter Mansfield here in, in Nottingham. And in this case, what we're doing is we're looking at protons in water or fats in the body. And that's what's most often observed. There are other approaches, but it's usually the very abundant 1H protons in water. And the, the point here is that the protons have different properties in different organs or tissues. And so if it's in a tumor cell, it has very different magnetic properties compared to how it is when, it, when it's in a, a normal tissue. And we can exploit that and it exploits these properties. Um, and here we have, for example, a, a gradient showing uh, small molecules, uh, small areas here of, of hemorrhage within a, a brain, for example, after, after some um, uh, lesions that have occurred in this particular uh, brain. So you can identify those by non-invasive magnetic resonance imaging. Here is a beating heart. So the passage of blood through different uh, valves in, in, the, in the heart can be identified. Uh, and that can help in a non-invasive way, of, again, a, a course ahead of surgery. And here, this is a functional magnetic resonance imaging. And this is looking at brain activity um, when moving parts of, of your body, say maybe talking, one part lights up, moving fingers lights up another. And then this can be used in a diagnostic way uh, before surgery when required. We'll hear more about optical imaging uh, from, from Sarah, I'm sure, tomorrow. Uh, and in, this is an area of, of, of research, optogenetics, which is very popular. Um, and there's over a thousand labs in, in the world use optogenetics. And what we're looking at here are neural impulses within a brain slice. And I know that some telecommunications companies are using this approach to understand neural networks to produce better communication facilities. And here we can even highlight the brain to see how our brain lights up during different tasks. So optogenetics is a very active area requiring some different types of uh, approaches. Now in your physics lessons, many of you may have heard of the diffraction limit, the Abbey diffraction limit, impossible to see anything below the wavelength of light, but due to um, advances by Stefan Hall of Gettian, for example, it's now possible using super resolution to, in, to visualize even individual molecules, which are way smaller than the wavelength of light within a, a, a cell. And you can see them here highlighted by different colors, uh, of course, by, by um, optical methods. And you can even now um, visualize single protein molecules in a membrane, in a cell. And here you can see the trajectory. And that has helped a lot to understand the scaffold proteins which hold that cell together. Here below are bacterial uh, cells with flagella. And from looking, these are fluorescently highlighted in this optical microscopy. Here we can now construct from all of the information one can get from these kind of approaches, the protein complex, which is the electric motor driving the flagella. That's a really complicated motor here, um, almost with, with the com um, commentator and the armature. Uh, and now we understand how those flagella work. And it's an electrical current going through that complex, which drives the flagellum to allow it to swim. So the electronics associated with pacemakers, for example, uh, defibrillators and so on, clearly involves a lot of electronic information. We have clearly ECGs are a good diagnostic way to look at the heart. But if we have uh, arrhythmia or some uh, ailment that requires electrical impulses to be corrected, we can now do this through uh, implanted devices. And of course, it's the electronics associated with uh, those features with, which is important. Here's a dialysis machine. And we can even now in using biophysical modeling go all the way through from 
the individual ion channels, which are defining the electric potential here across these membranes to drive the heart, right the way through to uh, molecular motors, through to whole heart pumping mechanics uh, to understand um, the electrical impulses around the heart. So this is called multi-scale modeling uh, of uh, whole organisms right the way from molecular to the whole organism. And this is a, a very important area when we want to understand, for example, disease states in, in hearts. And now for a biotechnological application, Oxford Nanopore, when it first floated on the stock market was a uh, billion dollars. It's now $4.8 billion market capitalization. Their goal is to enable the analysis of anything by anyone, anywhere, which sounds very optimistic. Here we have a membrane, here we have a protein, and here we have a core of DNA going through the protein, sending out an electrical impulse. That electrical impulse is, tells us the DNA sequence that's going through there. It's been used most recently in genome sequencing for COVID viruses, of, of course, uh, and they can do this for many other uh, areas as well. And this has come out of um, Hagen Bailey's uh, work, of course. Again, somewhat COVID related, lipid nanoparticles, and here is a nanoparticle which has been extracted and, and produced from the outer uh, cuticle of a C. elegans worm. And the reason why this was interesting is because this worm was able to generate itself antimicrobial resistance. And it was interesting to find out whether the lipid components associated with the resistant um, worm was any different from the normal wild type worm. And sure enough, it was. And so analyzing those lipids and understanding how the worm has been able to change its lipid composition to its outer cuticle to become resistant to, to, to uh, microbes is, is really quite interesting. Uh, and of course, we need to be aware that antimicrobial resistance is as big a problem worldwide as COVID and pandemics, of course, may well be one of the next major obstacles that we have to, challenges that we have to overcome. And just to bring it up to date yet more, nanoparticles, these lipid nanoparticles studied for about a decade by, by many uh, people, us included, are now being used to deliver mRNA in, um, in, in, in the vaccines that you know from uh, Pfizer, uh, Biotron, uh, BioNTech, and also uh, Moderna. So the biophysical characterizations of these nanoparticles has now led through directly into therapeutics uh, and uh, a good outcome. And just to be topical, environmental biophysics here, um, we do need to uh, be aware that we can grow algae. We have to understand the quantum yield and proton captures to produce bio oils. And here is a plant where that is all being calculated. We can look at gases produced, for example, um, before and after lockdown in Sydney as being monitored. We can understand that and measure those and even the environmental issues associated with events uh, in, 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 um, in, in volcanoes that are erupting under the seabed. <clears throat> so biophysics is important in all. So let me just finish with a couple of examples. Uh, this is the very recent Nobel Prize work from um, uh, Ardman Patoputian, for example. Mechanosensitive channels are channels which sit in the membranes of cells and when closed, they don't allow ions to pass, but when open, they allow ions to pass. And they're ubiquitous through all life forms. And what they, uh, what Bert Sackman and Evan Neo were able to do many years ago was to show that you could measure the currents going through into, uh, across the cell membrane using patch clamp methods and switch it on or switch it off. So this is current, and if the channel in this case is, is opened, then there's current going through and then it goes off. And this experiment here was done by putting pressure on the cell. So with more pressure, you have more um, channels open. And they did this by putting down some um, cells, mouse cell lines, in, cell line in fact, on, onto a, a cover slip, put a force on it, and to see whether the currents measured across this particular membrane were active or not. And they did this for a number of different proteins and different genes producing these channels and identified one particular channel, which they called a mechanosensory piezoelectric ion channel. So there's one particular channel which is sensitive to pressure. So put pressure on the cell, it opens the channel, 
and gives a response. No pressure, it's closed. And clearly, if you have a nice warm hug from somebody, you respond to that. So your uh, piezoelectric uh, piezo ion channels are opened when you're hugged, and that gives you a, a sensation. And indeed, Boris Martin, actually, in his review article, quoted there, he said there's this important role that mechanosensors play in the sustainability of different life forms in a variety of environments, including microgravity for human colonization of outer space. And it's those kind of receptors that tell you whether you're upside down, sideways, or you're in gravity or not in gravity. So this was awarded the Nobel Prize, this work, just last year. Uh, and to just this example, uh, I saw this from moth wings. Moth wings have a very um, complicated and complex wing structure. And they are uh, designed such that they avoid sound detection by bats. So the sound is absorbed by the moth wings. And so the bat cannot see it. And then of course, use it as a, as a food source and is, is, is deflected away from the, uh, the particular moth. Well, how can that have a biotechnological uh, impact? Well, understanding this kind of biophysics of sound absorption could then produce um, soundproofing materials. Um, for example, thin soundproof wallpaper has been a suggestion. And as a last example, Photoreceptors are the most abundant proteins on Earth. Here are some in a salt lake. They're purple because there are purple patches in these archaea bacteria which live in these salt lakes. And photons of light are absorbed by this and converted into electrical energy across the cell. They're solar cells. Very similar proteins are at the back of our eye and they receive light to allow us to see. Well, the trigger here is retinol. I showed you that earlier. So the detector size is very small, the light capture is very fast, there's no noise, it's very efficient, and biological photoreceptors are wavelength sensitive. But man-made detectors, the detectors are very large, light capture is slow comparatively, there's always noise, and they're wavelength dependent, and they need filters to select wavelengths. This is a camera from a typical phone, mobile phone. Here, is a uh, gold surface with these three nanometer proteins on the surface to give you a bio-inspired detector. And just to show you that has some application, not exactly the same uh, um, configuration at all, but here is a retinal implant using these bacterial receptors, photoreceptors, which has been implanted into the back of someone's eye to give them some sense of vision following retinal pigmentosis um, blindness that's in that patient. And this is from Lambda Vision, a company in Boston. So understanding the basic biophysics of all of these systems is now leading to that kind of uh, help. So what's biophysics? It provides a breeding ground for many new methods and approaches, and it changes. And those who've been in the field uh, a long time will see that happens. It is truly inter multi cross disciplinary science uses physics, chemistry, maths, it quantitates biology, and also provides the foundation for many med medical applications. And actually, having an identity crisis, not knowing what it is, can be good, keeps you open-minded. Lots of PhD courses around the world. I suggest you go to the Biophysical Society's website, it tells you where you can do biophysics. There are journals such as the Biophysical Reviews, which is the IUPAB journal, Nature has a biophysics section as well now. There are many societies, go to the conferences and workshops and subscribe to news groups if you want to hear more about that, um, about biophysics. And um, the majority of biophysicists start life in a different science, which is an interesting observation. And my last slide is to tell you about one of the next meetings supported by IUPAB. It's in Galway, Ireland, narratives from molecular machines to material at the end of June, beginning of July. So thank you. That's me finished, uh, Rui as Latin. Thank you. <clears throat> For an amazing presentation and showing the biophysics in, in um, relevant for, for all the recent happenings, especially about COVID. Um, so we're running short on time a bit, uh, but we have time for one question. Uh, there was an interesting question in chat, uh, basically asking, um, when is the right time to learn more about 
a specific area like biophysics or bioinformatics materials and sim or a similar uh, field. Uh, so maybe you could try to answer that question um, just in the way that you uh, said in the last slide. Okay. Uh, you said that people are brought to biophysics from other fields. What brought you to biophysics? Yes. So frequently that is the case. Uh, people come in from other areas of science, but there are now a number of biophysics schools. So if people, is not, people are undergraduates or looking to undergraduate courses, then they might go. But schools don't teach biophysics. They teach physics, they teach biology. And that's how I got into it. I was very interested in physics, very interested in biology, and I just didn't want to let those two go. So I stayed with it. But the postgraduate level for research is probably the more flexible way because you can go in with a discipline like chemistry or like physics or maths, and then you can go into a biophysics area and start developing from there. So that's the most flexible way because there aren't that many biophysics undergraduate courses in the world. There are some, but not an awful lot. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for the great answer. Uh, so in case you have any more questions, you can always uh, contact Anthony and the other speakers via their emails. The emails are listed right under this video's description. Uh, the next talk will be biophysical approach to unravel the mechanism of viral entry into human cells. Also something very relevant in, uh, in the current times. Uh, from Sai uh, from NIH Bethesda, USA. Uh, I hope you guys can see my presentation and I'm audible. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sai. I'm a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Ad Bax in the laboratory of chemical physics at National Institutes of Health, USA. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Today, I would like to present some of my recent biophysical work to understand the mechanism of viral entry into human cells based on my studies on uh, sars coronavirus, virus which is the causative agent of COVID-19 disease and also human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS in humans. So as the symposium is attended by several undergraduate students which have, who has a little bio, uh, biological background, let me begin the presentation with a small introduction to proteins and biophysical techniques. The proteins are the, as you all may know, proteins are the workhorses of cells. They are composed of building blocks of uh, amino acids. The gray color picture on the right here shows an unstructured protein where each sphere represents a single amino acid. So basically protein is made up of several amino acids. And these proteins adopt into different structures for their proper functioning in the cell. The forces that drive the protein structure formation are hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen atom and highly electronegative atoms, hydrophobic interactions between the hydrophobic amino acids, electrostatic interactions between the charged amino acids and disulfide bonds between the cysteine amino acids. Uh, the figure on the right shows a tertiary structural or cartoon representation of uh, two proteins that adopt alpha helical structure shown in green color or a beta sheet structure that contain multiple beta strands shown in orange color. In general, proteins contain uh, a mixture of both alpha helices and beta strands. Although for convenience, we show the proteins as the static structures, these proteins are dynamic in solution. And as uh, Professor Anthony Watts mentioned in his previous slides, they sample wide range of motions in the time scales of picoseconds to several seconds for, uh, for their proper functioning in the cell. So solution NMR spectroscopy is one of the biophysical tool that is utilized to understand the structure and dynamics of biomolecules. Uh, I hope many of you may have seen these big magnets or NMR spectrometers in the biophysics labs or in a chemistry labs. This NMR uh, spectroscopy is, has wide range of applications in identifying the interaction partners or in the discovery of novel drug targets. The major limitation of this technique is studying the uh, 
it becomes increasingly difficult to study the biomolecules which are uh, higher than 50 kilodalton in size. I think many of you may have come across uh, one-dimensional NMR spectrum in your chemistry undergraduates courses. The panel A shows the one-dimensional NMR spectrum of a hexapeptide, which consists of about uh, six amino acids. Typically, hexapeptides contain about 50 protons. And as we can see, all the peaks in the spectrum are well resolved. We can assign each proton to a specific peak. On the other hand, even a small proteins containing uh, 78 amino acids, this consists of about several hundreds of protons. And as we can see here, the NMR spectrum is very complicated and we cannot assign each peak to a specific peak, uh, to a specific proton. To overcome this spectral overlap, biomolecular NMR spectroscopy often involves measuring a two-dimensional or higher dimensional spectrum. The figure here shows the two-dimensional spectrum called 1H15 and HSQC of a protein. This is the most standard biomolecular NMR experiment. As from the name itself suggests, it shows all proton and nitrogen correlations in a biomolecule. And uh, as the, each amino acid contains a single NH group, a single amino acid in this HSQC spectrum can be visualized as a single peak. So for example, a protein of about 100 amino acids, you would expect to see about 100 peaks in this HSQC spectrum. The figure on the right shows the zoomed region of this HSQC spectrum displaying six amino acids in the absence of its uh, interacting partner or ligand. Whereas in the presence of small concentrations of ligand, we can see small chemical shift changes upon the addition of ligand, which is shown in blue color, uh, for a few resonances like uh, phenylalanine 114 and threonine 103. This suggests that these two residues are very close to the ligand binding site, whereas the other residues such as valine 118 and serine 126, they do not display any chemical shift changes, suggesting that they are very far away from the ligand binding site. Uh, additionally, with the increasing concentration of ligand, we see further increasing chemical shift changes, which saturates at a higher concentration of ligand. While quantifying the chemical shift changes with the ligand concentration, we can derive some important thermodynamic parameters, such as a coefficient of dissociation, which provides the information on how strong the ligand binds to the protein or a biomolecule of interest. With this basic uh, or introduction, let us enter into a, a research topic of my interest, which is membrane fusion. The first step of the viral infection is its entry into the host cell or human cell. The diagram here shows uh, a cartoon representation of the coronavirus. The enveloped virus such as coronavirus, HIV or influenza, they contain a spike protein which mediates me viral membrane fusion. As this is the only surface exposed protein which is present on the virus, this elicits immune response and these proteins are generally targeted for vaccine development. As you all may know, so far all the vaccines that are developed for the coronavirus treatment or, or for the vaccine development, they target the spike protein for the antibodies. The spike protein is homotrimer and it is composed of two subunits, S1 and S2 subunits. The receptor binding domain of the S1 subunit recognizes the host cell receptor, which is present on the host cell membrane. And this interaction leads to small conformational changes in the spike protein where the S1, S2 and or S2 prime sites are targeted by the host transmembrane proteases, which are not shown in this figure. The cleavage of these two sites results in the complete dissociation of the S1 subunit from the rest of the spike protein. This leads to large structural rearrangements in the S2 subunit where the hydrophobic fusion peptide in a spring-like motion gets embedded into the host cell membrane. In this fusion intermediate state, it is widely believed that the HR1 region, which is shown in the yellow color, adopts a three helical bundle structure. Further, in a series of less characterized events, HR2 folds back onto HR1, that results in pulling the membranes close together, eventually leading to pore formation. Once the pore formation occurs, the viral genetic material enters into the host cell for further infection. In this post-fusion state, the spike protein adopts a six-helix bundle structure where 
the interior three helices or the central three helices are formed by the HR1, which is showing yellow color, whereas the exterior three helices are formed by HR2, that is shown in red color. And it is widely believed that the energy released in the folding events of HR1 and HR2 is utilized to overcome the large energy barrier required to fuse the two negatively charged hydrophobic membranes. While high resolution structures of this post fusion state and pre fusion states are widely available across several viruses using uh, X ray crystallography or cryogenic microscopy, which was previously mentioned by Professor Watts, the lack of structural information on these intermediate states limits our understanding of this important biological phenomenon as these intermediate states could be targeted for the design of fusion inhibitors, which prevents the formation of the post-fusion state. To understand the structural information on this intermediate state, we initiated the project by recombinantly expressing and purifying the HR1 polypeptide, which is composed of about 50 amino acids. The HSQC spectrum of the HR1 polypeptide is shown in black color. So we asked if to investigate the membrane binding properties of this HR1 polypeptide, we used membrane mimetics such as bicells. The bicells are composed of DMPC bilayer in the central part of the bicells that contains long aliphatic lipid molecules, whereas the rim of the bicells are made up of small lipid molecules known as DHPC. In the presence of these bicells, HR1 polypeptide adopts a completely new chemical shift shown in blue color. This suggests that HR1 polypeptide adopts membrane bone conformation in the presence of bicells. To investigate if there are any secondary structural changes associated with this interaction, we recorded a circular dichroism spectroscopy measurements, which provide global secondary structural information. The CD spectrum for the HR1 polypeptide is shown in black color which reveals a typical alpha helical structure, although the alpha helical content is very low here. In the presence of bicells, the HR1 polypeptide adopts, shows a dramatic increase in the alpha helicity as shown in the blue colored curve. To validate if this interaction is real, we remeasured the CD spectrum in the presence of small unilamellar vesicles, which are considered to be the most ideal membrane mimetics. Even in the presence of small unilamellar vesicles, we observed an increase in the alpha helicity as shown in this purple color. This experiment clearly demonstrates that the HR1 polypeptide adopts alpha helical structure in both bicells and vesicles. As this is the global information, to obtain residue specific information, we measured 13C alpha chemical shifts from NMR spectroscopy. And the plot here shows the deviation of C alpha chemical shifts from the random coil chemical shifts. And as we can clearly see here, Almost all the residues have positive delta C alpha values, indicating that all the residues of this HR1 are involved in the alpha helical character. So to cut short, we obtained the solution structure of HR1, which is shown in the green color. This adopts a, this structure has a kinked conformation. So we further investigated which residues of this polypeptide chain interacts with the membrane bilayer and which residues are far away from the bilayer. So for this, we probed paramagnetic relaxation enhancement measurements where the nitroxyl free radical containing the unpaired electron is covalently attached to a long uh, aliphatic chain. Due to its hydrophobic nature, this 16 DSA molecule, when dissolved in a solution containing bicell, it is always present inside the bicells. So an amino acid that is close to the, or the amino acid which is Faces the lipid bilayer experiences attenuation in the NMR intensities due to the properties of the unpaired electron, whereas the amino acids that are far away from the or facing opposite side of the lipid bilayer, they experience minimum intensity in the NMR signal. And this can be demonstrated in this two figures here. Um, the HSQC experiment on, of the diamagnetic sample is shown here in the absence of this paramagnetic label in the blue color, whereas in the presence of the paramagnetic uh, label, the spectrum is shown in red color. As you can clearly see here, the residue nine experiences large attenuation in the intensities 
suggesting that the residue 9 is facing the lipid bilayer, whereas the residue 43 experiences minimum attenuation, suggesting that this is facing opposite of the lipid bilayer. These intensity changes are further quantitated into the change in relaxation rates, where residue 9 experiences severe attenuation has higher rates, and the residue 43 that has minimum attenuation has low change in rates. So we collected all the residues that are experiencing the low attenuation rates and plotted onto the surface of the structure, which immediately reveals the residues that are facing away from the lipid bilayer. As you can see here, almost all the residues are uh, hydrophilic, polar hydrophilic residues, whereas the opposite side of the this orange color residues contain uh, hydrophobic residues that interacts with the bile, lipid bilayer. As we can see here, in between these two orange residues, we see hydrophobic amino acids such as leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, and isoleucine extra. So this experiment clearly uh, help us in identifying which are the residues that face the lipid bilayer and which residues are facing outside of the lipid bilayer. So we went, went ahead to understand the biophysical properties of the HR2 polypeptide, which is at the C-terminal end of the spike protein. So we also observed that HR2 has lipid binding affinity. However, this interaction is quite weak, which is demonstrated in the HSQC spectrum. This spectrum shows overlay of several uh, NMR spectra obtained under different concentrations of bicells. So the chemical shifts of the HR2 polypeptide is in the absence of bicells is shown in black color. With the increasing concentrations of bicells, we see a steady increase in the, concept, in the chemical shift changes, which saturates around 270 millimolar of bicells. These chemical shift changes are further quantified and plotted against the concentration of bicells. And the data was fit globally to all the residues, which where we obtained the coefficient of dissociation is found to be 143 millimolar, suggesting the interaction between HR2 with bicells is very weak. However, in the context of the full length uh, protein, this HR2 is very proximal to the transmembrane domain, which is inadvertently placed in the lipid bilayer. In the in vivo system, HR2 may interact with the viral membrane for a large fraction of time. Similar to HR1, HR2 also displays increased alpha helical character in the presence of bicells, which we can see from the CD spectrum, where in the absence of bicells, it has weak alpha helical propensity whereas in the presence of bicells, we see increased alpha helical propensity. So far, uh, I have shown that both HR1 and HR2 has lipid binding propensity and they can adopt a membrane bound intermediate state. We then asked if we can transition the membrane bound intermediate state to a final post-fusion state. In other words, can we uh, make an in vitro assay where we can transition the membrane bound HR1 state to a final post-fusion 6-HP state with the addition of the HR2 polypeptide. For this, we made initially a 6-HB protein by covalently linking HR1 and HR2 polypeptide chains and collected the HSQC spectrum. Here is a small region of the HSQC spectrum showing the tryptophan residue that adopts a 6 helical bundle state and that has a chemical shift of 10 ppm. So we performed the NMR titration experiment beginning with a HR1 in a membrane bound state. In the absence of HR2, HR1 has a chemical shift at 10.4 ppm shown in blue color. With the addition of HR2, we observe uh, an appearance of a new resonance, which is close to the 10 ppm that resembles a six helix bundle state. With the further addition of HR2, we see that an increase in the intensity of six helix bundle state followed by a decrease in the intensity of the membrane bound state. This in vitro experiment clearly demonstrates the transitioning of the membrane bound state to a final post-fusion six helical bundle state. So with this structural information in hand, we went ahead to study the thermodynamic parameters such as kinetics and energetics involved in the membrane fusion mechanism of human immunodeficiency virus. The NMR spectrum on the left shows a small region of the HSQC spectrum showing three tryptophan residues 
of the protein that adopts a six helical bundle state. Whereas in the same spectrum, we see three, the same three tryptophan residues that adopt a lipid bound state, which is shown in olive color resonances. This suggests that the lipid bound state is in dynamic equilibrium with the post-fusion six helix bundle state. So as there is in a dynamic equilibrium between these two states, we can obtain important thermodynamical parameters such as off rates, on rates of the association, the coefficient of dissociation and free energy between these two states. As the 6HB state is homotrimer and the lipid bound state is a monomer, the reaction agrees with the monomer to trimer equilibrium, where the coefficient of dissociation is obtained as the concentration of monomer cube to the concentration of trimer. And at equilibrium, the concentration of free monomer and concentration of free trimer can be easily obtained from the intensity of the peaks that are in the lipid bound state and in the six helical bundle state. For this particular instance, uh, the population of the lipid bound state is about 35% and the population of the 6HB state is about 65%. We can uh, easily part up the population by simply changing the physical parameters such as uh, temperature by increasing the temperature from 310 Kelvin to 320 Kelvin, we put up the population of the lipid bound state from 35% to 60% as it is evident from the increase in the intensity of the lipid bound state, which also reduces the population of the six helix bundle state from 65% to 40%. This change in population affects the coefficient of dissociation and this data can be easily analyzed by Vantoff equation, where the natural logarithm of coefficient of dissociation depends on the free enthalpy change and the change, sorry, the change in enthalpy and the change in entropy. Further, we obtained the coefficient of diffusion uh, dissociation at multiple temperatures and plotted against the inverse of the temperature. And this can be analyzed using a by fitting the data to a straight line where the slope of the straight line provides the change in enthalpy values and the y-intercept provides the change in entropy values. As the free energy change of the reaction can be calculated as the delta H minus T delta S. From these values, we found out that delta G to be minus 11 kilocal per mole. This suggests that the 6HB structure is more stable than the lipid bound state by about 11 kilocals per mole. Further, we obtained the uh, enthalpy and entropy changes for a forward reaction and for a forward reaction and backward reaction and obtain the dependence of these rates by with a temperature dependence this this helped us in obtaining the free energy changes for the dissociation and from the k of rate we obtain the free energy change of 21 kilocalorie which is significantly higher than the 11.2 kilocalorie that we obtained from the previous slide. Further, the K on rates resulted in a free energy of 9.3 kilocal per mole, suggesting that the lipid bound state transitions to the six helix bundle state by following through a higher energy transition state. A previous uh, report in 2015 has suggested that the six helix bundle, the energy difference between the six helix bundle state and the five helix bundle state is about 15 kilocal per mole, where in the 5HP state, HR2 is dissociated from the 6HP state. As the 20.6 kilocal per mole is close to what, whatever the energy differences these other uh, research groups have reported, we speculate that the transition state resembles a higher energy state that is that resembles a 4HP or 5HP structures. Based on the structural and kinetic information we obtained from SARS coronavirus and HIV viruses, we propose a small modification to the membrane fusion model by incorporating a membrane bound state in the mechanism, where after, soon after the dissociation of the S1 subunit, S2 subunit adopts a pre hairpin intermediate structure where the fusion peptide gets embedded into the lipid bilayer as HR1 and HR2 are highly lipophilic, they collapse onto the membranes, resulting in pulling the membranes close together. And the folding of HR1 and HR2 results in the formation of 6HB and 5HB structures. 
that eventually leads to the formation of the final post fluidistic cells bundle state, where the viral genetic material enters into the host cell for further infection. As we obtained similar membrane-bound intermediate states in both HIV and SARS coronavirus, we propose that this lipid-bound state is conserved intermediate step across different viruses for this membrane fusion model. So the structural information of this membrane fusion was a few months published ago in the Science Advances Journal. And we recently submitted the thermodynamic and kinetic information of this membrane fusion model in the Journal of Molecular Biology. With this, I would like to thank my postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Adbax, for his continuous support and mentoring and John Luigi and Rodolfo Ghirlando for helping me with the uh, other biophysical measurements. And I'd also like to thank National Institutes of Health for my postdoctoral fellowship. And thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Sai, for such a comprehensive and visual display of uh, how our research in biophysics looks like. Um, so we have a question in chat. What yeah. has been discovered in the past two years about the viral entry into human cells? Uh, what has been discovered? I mean, uh, as um, Professor Watts has already shown, this by obtaining the structures of this uh, post-fusion or pre-fusion states of the mutants on the wild types, we can clearly see how the antibodies or how the modifications in viruses escape the existing antibodies. So these are some of the important discoveries from the structural biology view of viruses. Thanks for the, for the answer. So in case you have any questions, any further questions for Sai, uh, you have his email in the video's description. Um, so I would like to invite the next speaker, Bjorn, from Karolinska Institute with his presentation, Software Development for Cryo-Electron Microscopy of Cell Surface Receptors in Neurobiology. Very complex, but I hope he'll make it simpler. There we go. You can hear me and see my presentation. Lovely. Uh, yes, so hi, my name is Bjorn. Uh, I do cryo-EM, so I use some of the structural uh, methods that Anthony mentioned. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at Karolenska Institute in Sweden, um, but I'm doing a project at the University of Oxford at the moment, where we are trying to, to use cryo-EM to see these cell surface receptors uh, that are relevant for neurobiology. Uh, I figured I'd start with just letting you know basically how I got here. So I actually started out doing atomic physics. So like Anthony said, biophysicists come from, from many other fields. Uh, I then wanted something with a bit more application uh, that wasn't as abstract as, as uh, hard physics, let's say. So I started doing biomolecular dynamic simulations, and I did that with Bette Grot at the Max Planck in Göttingen. Uh, that's actually in the same department as Helmut, uh, who will be speaking Thursday. So I know him from before as well. <clears throat> I then returned to Stockholm to do my PhD. I did that with Eric Lindahl, who wrote uh, Gromax, the simulation package. Uh, but I ended up doing method development for CryEM software. Uh, notably, I contributed to the Reliant source code. Uh, so Reliant is one of the main tools used to reconstruct uh, molecular structures uh, in cryo -EM. And since then, I've been more of a structure biologist. I've been applying cryo to flexible and uh, membrane complexes of different proteins. Uh, but I would think of myself uh, not so much as a structure biologist. I, I think of myself as a molecular biologist because my emphasis is on interactions and dynamics of these structures, not just the structures themselves. Uh, my, my main tool, of course, is, is structure-based uh, cryo-EM. Uh, so yeah, I would consider myself a biophysicist, uh, according to all the definitions set up by Anthony. Uh, if you're more curious about cryo-EM after my talk, I should mention about an hour after this session finishes, 
uh, Shorts, the, the main originator of the Reliance software, will be receiving an award and speaking about the, the recent revolutions and trends in Korea. Uh, so I really recommend that. And that's through the Royal Society. Uh, but for, for your benefit, I'll, I'll describe cryem in very brief terms. So we have what we call particles. Uh, on your far left, you see some sort of prototypical particle, and these are typically protein complexes or uh, protein DNA complexes, whatever you want to look at structurally. Uh, and those are then suspended in solution. <clears throat> and then we apply a very small amount of this solution onto a copper grid. Uh, and within these holes, you have a thin layer of carbon with round holes in them. And these holes are then uh, saturated with this particle solution. Uh, and we then drain away excess and freeze it very rapidly. And that gives us a sample that we can uh, look at with an electron microscope. So what we end up with is microscope images, like the one you see on the top right, where you see the, the whole outline to, to some extent. And you also see in numerous of these particles uh, in the field of view. And now, if we could have ideal images, we wouldn't have any noise, but we're not that lucky. So most of the time we get extremely noisy images and the smaller our particles are, the more noisy these images get. Uh, so typically we collect data sets that encompass something like a million of these particles. And then we try to, to process the data that is uh, extract the shared features. We try to acquire images from many different orientations so that we can reconstruct the three dimensional object. So, so the core aim of CryEM is basically this. <clears throat> so, so the fundamental challenge, if you were to, to boil it down, regards the fact that these particles are inherently unknown orientations. So we don't know from which way we are looking at these particles. So we have to align them. Uh, and then we have to contend with the fact that many of these particles could be of, of different species. So we could have different types of particles, different occupancies of other things. So we have to employ classification in order to separate this computationally. And this is an inherently difficult uh, step to validate. So we might end up with different classification results if we run the algorithms twice or more. So, so there's many unanswered questions about uh, high fidelity processing in Quarium that needs to be clarified. And that's part of my interest. So when I was part of the development uh, team in, in Reliant, what we did was we looked at the fundamental structure of refinement, which takes a bunch of particle images, uh, and it also takes a reference model, and then it basically compares those in different ways, uh, finds the optimal ways uh, that they fit, and then uses that information to reconstruct a better reference model. And this is then repeated over and over again to, to incrementally build a better reference model. This is the core algorithms within any method uh, currently used for CryEM uh, reconstruction. But you will note that we have to repeat this for all images, uh, and we have to repeat it for every single orientation that we might conceive every of one of these particles to be in. So really what we, what we end up with is a truly massive amount of image comparisons. Every single particle image is compared up to millions of different ways to each reference. And we have to do this every single time. So, so in the end, this was a problem that was submitted to, to supercomputers for weeks at a time. Uh, and that was really hampering the application of the method. Uh, so we looked at how to restructure that and make it much, much faster so that it would be a more tractable method and, and much more easily applied. Uh, and what we were able to do was to speed it up by 10 to 40 times. We did that mostly by making sure that these image processing tasks were on suited hardware, which tends to be graphics cards or, or GPUs. And it's really, as sort of a proof of principle of this, it's really remarkable how, how quick you can, you can do this now. Um, in this example, what we did was we went to the supermarket and bought spinach leaves. This is, you could, we could eat them if we wanted to, but uh, we blended them and then by some standard biochemical purification protocols, we were able to, to isolate ribosomes uh, from these leaves. As you can see at the top right, it's, it's a fairly crude size exclusion, so it's a fairly dirty sample. This is not pure whatsoever, uh, but nevertheless, we can collect data. And because we have this capacity of classification and because ribosomes are fairly uh, easy targets, uh, we're able to get a nice, highly resolved 3D reconstruction within 24 hours. So this really shows that this paper that came out now five years ago or something, even then, 
this was a very high throughput method and cryem is really changing how we think of, of high throughput uh, screening in that structural sense <clears throat> and just to show you the, the importance of, of this being high resolution rather than just visualizing how components are sort of situated with respect to one another this is uh, a more recent project uh, where i looked at the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex uh, so this is a metabolic complex that uh, in basically every cell on earth um, in eukaryotes you form this uh, highly symmetric assembly that you see on the top right in a schematic and in fungi it's a bit special so you have this green component that's actually situated inside the, the core complex and is specifically used to recruit uh, an e3 component now if we we tried to reconstruct this before, uh, about two years ago, and the best we could do was what you see on the bottom left, where we could see this interior component to some extent, but we couldn't really identify exactly how it was uh, molecularly assembled and how it interacted. But since then, I've been able to sort of reprocess this data by breaking the complex apart and really employing uh, very recent additions to, to how we process brain data. And by, by doing that and further classifying the data, you can get a much better picture than the one you see on the bottom right. So this affords us the opportunity to then start to build in atomic models into this. And the benefit of that is, is obvious. So, so now we can actually start to model this with, for instance, molecular dynamics. So what you see here is uh, tentative simulations that actually show the flexibility and arrangement of these things. And importantly, what I've highlighted in red here, we don't know how that is structured. So this is a partially disordered region that seems to be, be incredibly conserved in, in some parts, but we have no idea what it does. So the idea behind these simulations then is to try to, to probe exactly how stable it is with and without this and, and what the purpose of it is. So, so it's really important to reach high resolution, even if you can't expect uh, a very singular shape of your protein or protein complex. So the project I'm involved with now uh, focuses much more on membrane proteins. So, so cells have many different membrane compartments. Uh, mitochondria, mitochondria are uh, a notable uh, membrane bound compartment, but you also have the, the EAR and the nucleus, uh, all of which have important membrane proteins within them. Membrane proteins are one of the protein types that is very challenging to study using uh, X ray crystallography, for instance. So, cryem is uniquely suited to this. Uh, the membrane proteins that I'm interested in sit in the cellular membrane, so this outer shell of, of, of cells. <coughs> and Membrane proteins, as I mentioned, can be studied with CAR-EM. So this is one of the, the previous projects I've been, been involved with. Uh, but normally when we look at or, or membrane proteins, we, we have a fairly substantial membrane domain. Uh, and that's the case with this Glick channel, which is uh, a bacterial version or homolog of, of uh, human neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, so what you see on the bottom left is class averages from CAR-EM processing. And there you can clearly see an elliptical belt of detergent or, or membrane situated around the region, which is typically in a membrane. And then you have this head poking out. So this is a fairly substantial domain that behaves in a very predictable way and detergent really likes it and you get this belt. But the membrane proteins that I'm mostly interested in uh, don't conform to this motion, notion. Um, they are called single pass transmembrane receptors. Uh, and there's a quite a lot of them. There's something like 1,300 uh, of these different receptors in, in humans. Uh, and they're composed of three parts. You have a fairly substantial domain that's outside the cell or an extracellular domain. Uh, and you have an intracellular domain uh, that is inside the cell that tends to, to send signals into the cell based on what the outside of the cell senses. And then the portion that's in the cell membrane is very minimal, typically only one helix or very, very, um, very, very small domain. Uh, so these can look in many different ways. They can have large domains, small domains, disordered. Uh, so they're typically very challenging to, to look at with cryem because they have intrinsic flexibility and are fairly small. So that limits uh, or it really makes the noise threshold high for these particle types. So it's very difficult to process them using conventional methods. 
they're really important. You don't have to look much further than, than the PDB. So I noticed when Anthony was showing the PDB uh, uh, starting page that there was in fact a single pass transmembrane receptor uh, as the molecule of the month. And if you go back one month, you find another one. So you can clearly see how, how important these things are. Now these structures are actually composite structures. So nobody has actually determined these receptors uh, within a membrane context. What people have done is they've uh, done crystallography and cryem possibly to, to see the separate domain. So they've seen the outside, they've seen the inside and the parts that's in the membrane, but they haven't seen the whole thing in, in its entirety and understood how it interacts and what type of interactions with the membrane uh, might affect their signal relay. So, so there's really unexplored ground here. And what my aim is to do is to understand this much better. So canonically, we would expect these receptors to exist on their own. Uh, with no signal effect. And then upon binding of a ligand or a morphogenic cytokine, we would expect these uh, receptors to pair up or form triplets or even higher uh, pairings. Uh, and that would then allow the signal to be relayed. There's a number of different proteases that actually act on these receptors as well and basically cut them. Uh, you can have the entire outside part of these receptors shedded, so it just leaves the cell. Uh, you can have it cut in the middle of the membrane portion, or you can have proteases that process the signal affecting domain. So there's many avenues of exploration here as well uh, that require much more than cryem to fully dissect their function. Uh, but mostly what I'm interested in is trying to establish exactly how these receptor complexes form and how they, what they look like and how the membrane affects them. More specifically, uh, what I look at biologically is axon guidance. So when a nerve cell uh, wants to make a new connection, uh, it sends out one of these axons. And these axons can be incredibly long with respect to cell sizes. It, they can be thousands of times uh, the size of the cell itself. Uh, but when it grows, it has the leading edge has what's called a growth cone. And that's what you see on the bottom right. And this, this growth cone basically listens to the cues of where to go. Uh, so it needs to find these guidance cues in order to turn and find the appropriate connection. And one of these uh, receptors that I'm interested in is the netrin receptor. Uh, there's a numerous netrin receptors. Many things respond to netrin. And netrin is of growing uh, importance when it comes to medical applications because it interacts with so many things. Uh, but I'm interested in neogenin, which is one of these axon guidance uh, receptors. And it's really remarkable that depending on which of these receptors and co-receptors you have on the growth cone and what morphogens you find in the environment, you get very different responses from the uh, growth cone. You can have attraction, you can have repulsion, uh, you can have potentiation of that repulsion, and you can even have silencing if you have both of the cues available. And this is more than just a competition. This is actually both of these morphogens um, interacting with the same receptor molecule and, and affecting silencing or muting signal affecting. So, so it's really an interesting model system. Uh, it's interesting how we can have such different cellular responses uh, through the same signal activation pathway. So my research now uh, is mostly dedicated to developing pipelines for looking at single pass transmembrane re receptors uh, using cryia uh, with the aim of, first of all, understanding these netron receptors, but then also more broadly, making sure that we can look at more of these 1300 uh, single pass transmembrane proteins. So at the moment, it's, it's a lot of development is going into developing these pipelines so that we can understand how we pr can prepare these membrane proteins in a membrane-like environment using detergents or uh, lipid nanodisks or different polymers and extract them and trigger complex formation. We do this currently by monitoring uh, by FRET-based approaches, how close the proteins are to one another, uh, and optimizing their affinity uh, from that. <clears throat> We've already seen a few interesting uh, correlations in, in trying to establish these structural views. And one of those is that whenever we have pre-clustering or, or sort of um, pairings of these receptors before we even added any uh, 
any triggering molecules, we seem to be getting a protect, protective effect of the uh, intracellular domain. So, so this basically seems to be modulating how much signal can be activated. Uh, an alternative explanation is that if we get these proteolytic processing events of our receptors, uh, it seems that we can no longer form pairings, even though we still maintain the, the regions that are known to be uh, interacting during pair formation. So, so there's really interesting questions and they're clearly uh, required the membrane to be present uh, in order for us to study them completely. So this pipeline is, is really important to establish. Uh, what indications we do have from CAR-EM at the moment is uh, fairly vague, but interesting. So we can, it's, it's very difficult to process these because they're inherently flexible. And that's evident uh, very early on. So when we do 2D classification of one of these uh, receptor complexes, uh, we find that we can't really reach the, the level of resolution where we can be confident about what they are. Uh, but the reasonable thing based on what we know uh, about the, the domains that we know exist within these proteins is that we are getting pair formation to some extent. So there's a number of classes on the right here, which sort of resemble what I would call um, almost chromosomes. Uh, but these are then pairs of extracellular domains that uh, bind together and interact uh, in different ways. So, so we're not at the level where we can process these data to, in, to three dimensional reconstruction with high fidelity yet, but that's where more dedicated method developments come, comes in. So that's the second aim of my research, is trying to, to develop uh, methods that can actually look at such small and flexible proteins, such as, uh, such as these. Uh, the fundamental things we have to be able to do there is we have to make the algorithms more tolerant to noise and aware of how high the noise is. Uh, but crucially, we also have to, to be able to assess to what quality and fidelity we're getting results, because we can't at the moment. And just as a quick example of that, uh, if we go back to this higher dehydrogenase complex that I talked about before, uh, during the first processing of these, it was fairly interesting because we saw this interior uh, component that is highlighted green here. And then we looked at the geometry. And based on the geometry, we realized that there has to be another configuration. There, there's no reason why we couldn't have another configuration that would be equally, equally probable. Uh, but we never really saw that. And, and, but only after going back to the data and digging quite extensively did we then find it. So Reliant was not able to, to, to tell us, or the programs weren't able to tell us that it was missing something. We had to realize that ourselves and go back. So, so that's just to say that the way we process cryon data at the moment is deficient in the sense that we don't have the proper tools to make competent assignments about what we know and what we don't. So my ideas here go basically in two directions. The first is to, to develop methods to validate and assess how well CRIEM is doing. Uh, my notions here are basically to, to do spatial or temporal signal separation. And instead of doing a straight comparison between a reference structure and your particle image, you would then split your image information uh, and only use part of it for validation. That's the simple, uh, way of describing that notion. Uh, but the more interesting, I think, is the one on the right, which is basically trying to make uh, our data assessment more tolerant to, to noise. So at the moment, again, we're doing a straight comparison between a reference and a particle image. Um, the idea here is that we would overcome the low noise setting by doing averaging first of particles and then doing fitting of it. Uh, this really creates somewhat of a combinatorial explosion in terms of uh, how the algorithms work at the moment. Uh, but that is the interesting challenge. So we're basically trading uh, the problem of high noise for one of combinatorial explosion. So, so there's many things that need to change in order to make that tractable. But I think it would be interesting to try and make this um, help us get to small particle sizes and being able to look at these kinds of receptors. So I will conclude there and not describe it in, in too much detail. Uh, but I hope I've given you a good idea of what my research in, in biophysics looks like, uh, that I want to understand structure, but primarily organization and dynamics within these receptor complexes, uh, and basically what kind of challenges drive the method developments in CRIEM that we, we do at the moment. Uh, and so with that, I have 
thanks to give to all the people in the lab here who are helping me do this and also all the people who, who got me here uh, and of course to, to funding organizations for, for providing the opportunities to, for me to do this interesting science. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions and my contact is uh, listed at the top there if you have any more comments, questions or just want to get in touch. Thank you for the amazing talk. So we have two questions. Uh, first, um, how did you learn all the bio terminology and the bio understanding, considering you have a physics background? Yeah, I mean, it is challenging. Uh, it's one where you just have to immerse yourself. I feel a lot of people are moving from a physical background or, or sort of a, a biophysical background into more, more biologically oriented things. And to be, to be honest, it's just about it's, it sounds like a cliche, but this thing where you surround yourself with people that know more about it and you just keep asking and you just study hard. That's... And the second question. Um, so we have a student that is intrigued by this topic. Um, how did you arrive at this research topic and do you have any suggestions on how to find uh, a research topic? I would say... So, so when I did my PhD, I was dead set on doing biomolecular simulations because I was interested in the transition states. So when something is open and, and moves to a closed state, for instance, there's a very low probability of, of ever seeing structural information of the intermediate state. So, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, but then you just... Sorry, I lost track a bit. The, the question was... So yeah, the question was, um, how did you arrive at this research topic and do you have any suggestions? Right. So, so I don't have any suggestions for what to prioritize. Uh, my point was gonna be, sorry, no, yeah, on my train of thought. My, my point was that I had to adapt to the opportunities that were are available to me. I think there's a lot of interesting research that you can find an interest in if you don't um, if you don't limit yourself to what you think that you're doing. And I think a lot of the times people tend to dig in and think this is my specialization, uh, but you can you can move away from from things and keep developing your skill set. So I don't want to say just do what you think is interesting because I don't think that's as productive as people might think it is. But I think be very aware of the opportunities and talk to people and, and just sort of explore many different things. You can ask people for, for opportunities to, to partake and, and try things. Uh, in, in research, generally, people are very welcoming uh, to, to just open contacts. If somebody were to email me and say, can I can I look at this? What would we do about this? People take time out of their schedule uh, to just sort of communicate and, and describe because everybody's enthusiastic and doing this because they like it. So I think being open and sort of exploring the, the opportunities that are around you, even though you don't see them, I think if you follow those, you'll find basically what you want to do and something that will be productive. That's, it sounds vague and it's not very specific, but unfortunately that's sort of how it works. Thanks for answering the questions. Um, so I would like to thank all the speakers today once again for their great presentations and all the people that attended. Uh, we'll be resuming tomorrow at the same time. There is 15 sharp UTC uh, with three more amazing talks. Thanks everyone once again. Thanks, Ron.